Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Good afternoon, listeners, or morning, whenever you're tuning in. Thank you so much for giving us a little bit of your time. I think you're going to find this one a great topic today. With me is Dr. Jonathan Fellows. He is with the Michigan Institute of Neurological Disorders, and he is working on getting a clinical trial ramped up for Agilhelm, which you recall was approved back in June of 2021. And so we're going to talk about a little bit what's going on with research and Maybe we could touch on a little bit about why these drugs aren't covered with uh, by Medicare. So thanks for joining me, Dr. Fellows. Thank you. Thank you. So why don't we start with your background and get to know you just a little bit? Yeah. So I'm an adult neurologist. I see really all diseases under the neurological umbrella, but we certainly see a great deal of dementia. Uh, and when you talk about dementia, in particular, Alzheimer's disease, amongst other forms of, of dementia. Uh, We actually, our office, me and a few other doctors, we run a residency program through uh, what used to be called Beaumont, and it's now Corewell Health. Uh, So we have 16 residents as well. So we train adult neurology residents. Um, Our office, we have different centers. We have Alzheimer's and memory care. We have MS and demyelinating disease. We have Parkinson's and movement disorders. We have headache and facial pain. So these different pods within our within our office, if you will. So we all sort of do general neurology and also uh, subspecialize in these different fields as well. I could probably talk to you all all afternoon just about neurology because it's all that stuff's very interesting. Bring but... it on. <laughs> well, I'm assuming adult neurology is different from pediatric neurology because brains aren't as fully developed. You know, some of the things do carry over, uh, but it's a little tougher caring for the kid. There's some For example, there's some epilepsy syndromes that we see only in childhood that we don't see in adulthood. There are different medications. Um, uh, This office used to have pediatric or child neurology. And actually, just on the eve of COVID, uh, we sort of we we uh, disbanded the the program. Uh, Good and bad. It was hard to maintain that um, that service line, if you will. It was difficult to recruit and retain uh, pediatric neurologists. There's not there's not a ton of them around. Um, and for the most part, they, uh, these kids almost were better served in the, in the hospital setting where a lot of these child neurologists are employed. They're employed by hospital systems as pros by private groups, which is what we have. Makes sense. It's interesting. I guess I didn't have to deal with my mom's neurologist for very long. So I didn't realize there was so many, if the, this is not the correct term, you could tell me like subspecialties in neurology. Like the headache and facial pain kind of appeals to me because I've suffered from headaches like all my life until I finally got on hormone replacement therapy and finally got rid of the monthly migraines I used to have. Right. So we all treat migraines, for example, but those, again, we have emerging therapies in that sphere as well. And uh, therapies become more and more complex, require greater specialization. So what we found over the years in neurology is that as these, as therapeutics, including we can talk about some in the Alzheimer's sphere, uh, become more complex, we wind up having people that just sort of gravitate toward their different fields. Some of them are fellowship trained and some are just over time, they become experts in their field, you know, subspecializing, whether that be headache or Parkinson's, MS, dementia, that sort of thing. I can understand the subspecialties of MS, Parkinson's, and other dementias, just because those are all very different, was the term, pathologies. Um, But the other stuff was interesting to me. So you are, if I'm correct, ramping up a clinical trial, getting one started for Agilhelm. That is so hard to say. (laughs) Right. So Aducanumab or Agilhelm, like you say, it's been approved for a long time uh, and controversial. In fact, I think, I can't remember on our last talk did we we might have talked about it then i don't i don't remember if we were talking about it at all Um, i don't remember either (laughs) obviously very controversial as you and your listeners know in terms of it getting approved and just you know fda advisory committee way back when and all the sort of drama that was associated with the drug and us as clinicians you know we just want what's best for our patients and we want to be able to offer them you know, everything we possibly can, obviously, you know, not comprising, uh, compromising safety by any means, but we want to be able to 
uh, offer them as, as much opportunity and, and time is of the essence as these diseases, these neurodegenerative diseases do uh, progress, some at a more rapid rate than others. And um, as part of Biogen's commitment, if you will, they did go forth and they designed a clinical trial to, I guess, more or less confirm the effectiveness of what they had from their original trials, which granted them FDA approval. And there were some pitfalls as well and some issues, some of it being diversity. And I think that's one of the reasons why our site was uh, uh, was picked, mind. Uh, we are a clinical site and we're just onboarding and enrolling patients right now. Uh, we're pre-screening, well, we're screening several patients this upcoming week, uh, for example. We pre-screened dozens over the last three or four weeks. And uh, obviously there's a bunch of inclusion and exclusion criteria that makes it somewhat challenging to recruit patients, but not not impossible. But we are in a suburban area, but a diverse suburban area with um uh, socioeconomic and uh, racial uh, diversity. I I think even in a suburb of met, uh, metropolitan Detroit, we have a great deal of diversity. So that was that was appealing to the powers that be to grant us this site. I know that's one of the focuses for the Alzheimer's Association <laughs> is to help diversify clinical trials, which obviously is important. Can't just test on one type of person, especially because we know. Alzheimer's affects the brain differently. So everybody that gets Alzheimer's is affected differently. I don't know how and there's gender racial and disabilities. yeah, I, was saying, I don't know how I well my neural like hang on a second. What is my <laughs> neuropsychologist friend um, has talked to me a lot about the challenges that the black population face with Alzheimer's and and how it is different with. Um, you know, from white people or even Hispanics. So that's, that's really interesting to me. Can you touch on that a little bit? Being not that I have not grown up in any kind of diverse area, which is kind of, I'm probably people will think is surprising knowing I'm from California. Well, there's greater prevalence in, in black population for, for dementia and Alzheimer in particular. Um, and I mean, it still boils down to city folks and access to healthcare. So um, <clears throat> I, you know, and that's not unique for neurodegenerative conditions, cardiovascular disease, diabetes management, you know, all, all of the above. And when you talk about, um, you know, the aging brain or the failing brain, and then you talk about chronic health conditions on top of it, it's just going to exacerbate or accelerate these, you know, these health conditions that might just be one pot of CNS things, but it's really when the whole picture is looked at, if they're chronically hypertensive, if their sugars are chronically elevated, if they have hyperlipidemia, if they're not exercising, we know that the neurodegenerative process is going to be more robust. And in fact, we counsel our patients all the time. You know, it's important to look at the whole picture. And they're like, you know, doc, forget about any infusion medication that might be a amyloid sequestering drug. We're like, what are the, what are some things we can do? Well, forget about drugs for a minute. You know, let's focus on your sleep. Let's focus on your diet. What are you putting in your mouth? Let's focus on your exercise. Like if you can, if we can do those three things, these are powerful tools to maintain the status quo as opposed to seeing folks decline at a more rapid rate. You, I read a lot about that, you know, diet, ex, you know, Good sleep hygiene, good nutrition, exercise, main, manage your stress, and all. This. It's like it's a full time job, basically, of which ninety nine percent of it I do. Um, have there actually been clinical trials? I think there have been on lifestyle changes that help. There's a ton of data out there. I can't cite any in particular because it's too numerous to count. I mean, and there's studies on everything you just said, from plant based diet. Uh, there's not really, I wouldn't go so far as to say like dietary supplements because we're not going to go there. I think that's a whole other thing. But if you talk about a low fat or mostly plant-based diet, if you talk about controlling risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, if you talk about things like daily exercise, uh, and you definitely talk about sleep and mitigating things like obstructive sleep apnea or other primary sleep disorders, these are all things that have been proven time and time again to prevent or slow progression of degenerative brain disease. And do you think that message actually gets out there well enough that people are getting it? I mean, I get it, but this is what I do. So it just, it feels really like, hard. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I talk um, to a lot of people. I live in a slightly older demographic, older than me. And a lot of people are like, I just don't want to know. There's nothing you can do. I'm like, no, that's not true. Or, you know, they freak out because 
they can't remember names, which I've never been able to do. Or, you know, they walk in the room and they're like, why did I come in here? And then they kind of, because they're older, they like, they have momentary panic, like, oh no. And it's like, no, 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 that's not necessarily a sign of something bad. You know, if we all walk into the room and go, why did I come in here? And that's just because we're not paying attention. But right. it doesn't we don't call feel... that, you know, we don't jump to dementia when patients just complain of those things. And we have many patients that will complain of that and we'll do cognitive testing, we might even do brain imaging, might do other diagnostic studies. But, you know, that story, I'm not, I don't, I don't jump to dementia based on that. But, you know, in regard to your first question, it's, it's hard to talk about those things because it's very time consuming. It's time consuming to have the discussion about weight loss. It's hard to discuss, have the discussion about educating on putting better foods into your mouth. It's hard and time consuming to have the conversation about exercise. All those things take away from, you know, oh, we got to do this pill. We got to do this pill. We got to do this pill. And patients want, you know, patients want to get better and they think that medications are the way to get better. So that they, they gravitate toward that as well. So like I tell, you know, hey, we're going to talk about this on this visit and your next visit, we're going to talk about this next thing. So it may not all happen on one visit, but we're going to touch on all those things within a, within a six month time frame for sure. That makes sense. And, and easing into it makes more sense. I'm just a little bit surprised because, and maybe I, you know, I, I use a, the Apple news app. So I'm constantly getting push notifications about, you know, the, they've proven that walking will help, you know, your cognitive health. And they're, they're, there's, I get push notifications about that stuff all the time. So it surprises me that many of my neighbors are still in the dark. I guess yeah. it's just because, you know, quick fix would be a lot easier than, you know, losing weight and changing everything about your life so that your brain is healthier. I One of the things that I maintain is that I don't really think our modern life is all that healthy for our brains. And you know, we've got noise pollution, light pollution, air pollution, you know, stress, we're commuting, we're sitting too much, we're eating garbage food, people drink too much because they're stressed and they're not sleeping good because they drink. It's just like on and on and on. Do you, do you agree with that statement somewhat? I agree completely. And I think we do a really good job of, um, we do a really good job of complicating our own lives. You know, many folks live way beyond their means and they're two income family and there's no time to discuss and there's poor, you know, and then they're increased stress and they're getting poor sleep. And then that's when like the 50 year old brain or the 60 year old brain, maybe that <clears throat> really is not dementia in any way, but they come in for evaluation. And that's when we're uncovering a lot of these other unhealthy or less healthy habits, because they say, oh, you know, I used to be able to do five things at once and multitask, and I can't even complete one task now, or I walk into the room and I forget what I went there for, or I used to be so good with names and now I can't, I can't recall anybody's name. And, you know, our lives are complex and probably more complex than they need them, than, than they need them to be. And me personally, I've worked really hard to like simplify my life and try to, you know, you know, uh, kind of like compartmentalize things and really focus on one thing. Cause I have found that as I try to do too much, I do get a little like overwhelmed at times and it's hard. And I'm you only get 52. Over... <laughs> well, I'm 56 <laughs> and sometimes it's like, I feel like, well, I, I don't multitask. I'm very, I'm very good at making a to-do list and writing down, like, I know how long certain tasks take. So I allot enough time to comp to accomplish all the tasks with emails disrupting and and I make sure I only I only schedule a certain amount for the day and then then I'm done then go do something I'm else walk you, the dog uh, I'm glad you brought up the to-do list also and that's something I counsel my patients on like almost every time and I don't care how you do it but I do feel that the old school way of writing it out uh, especially in our 60, 70, and 80-year-old patient population. Yes, Here we yes. go, and I love to scratch it off. <laughs> oh, and you just, you're, 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 that's music to my ears because I tell them that, and it's true, the act of crossing it off is actually very therapeutic to solidify in your brain that you have completed that task, that you now remember that you've completed that task. And it also, it helps you realize that you've completed something and that's, that's just helpful for you. And then the stuff you don't complete, you're not going to be upset about that. You're going to rewrite it again. The first thing in the morning, the next day, when you do the next day's to-do list. So you're going to go through and it's a constant recycling. I still use this. I use the it's iPhone. Fun. And uh, 
I use my phone to do list and I constantly am like, you know, uh, talking to Siri and getting things, uh, you know, uh, reminders and things like that. And that's really helpful for me. I find I learned a long time ago. Like if you wake up like <gasps> in a panic, like, oh my gosh, did I do X, Y, Z? If you just make a list of everything you need to do, then your brain's not trying to remember, okay, now when I'm awake, I got to do the da 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 you know, and then it's spiraling your to-do list through your poor brain that's supposed to be sleeping and, and taking care of all the tasks your brain's supposed to do while you sleep. So I've always been old school to-do list. I mean, I had to go out on the internet to find the little fancy, you know, template that I use. It's goofy. It's just the way I work. I'm visual, so Works. I like it. It's great. Yeah. And it's... And it, I find what I try to do also is basically like, okay, so next week, this is March 9th and next week I'm leaving for the Alzheimer's association. So for the DC, for the forum day. And so I've got extra things to do. And so I look back, I'm like, okay, here it's Thursday afternoon. And I start thinking about what needs to be done next week so that I get to DC and I'm not freaking out that I forgot something or you know, I'd, I'd really rather not bring my laptop, but if I have to, I might. That's still up in the air. Um, the third week of the month is usually kind of a busy month for doing stuff for the podcast, so I probably will bring it just in case. But I would, I like to know that I try to project, okay, what do I need to do next week so that I'm not behind? I'm not, I don't get to Tuesday afternoon and go, ah, I forgot to do my email newsletter, which goes out on Wednesdays. <laughs> you know, and it's just, it, just for me, it just prevents stress and and re you know rearranging your day because you've forgotten to do these things and something else pops up that needs your attention and all of that stress, which is not necessarily high stress, but it's just I don't need it, so I try to keep it out of my life. Well, think about that stress with a patient with an underlying degenerative brain process like Alzheimer's disease. And maybe their schedule isn't quite as packed as yours and they don't have 15 things and nine podcasts going on and appointments, but they have a half a dozen things that they need to ensure get done throughout the week, doctor's appointments, uh, paying bills and things like that. If they're not written down and organized, they're going to forget. And when they forget item number one, that snowballs into forgetting items two through six, and then that becomes a problem. So that's why staying ahead with the to-do list, looking at the calendar, always forecasting and making that part of your daily routine is paramount. And so I do spend a great deal of time with my patients counseling them on that. And I, I think it's, I think they hear me and they they hear the importance because it's a change. Normally, this is the individual that was able to multitask and do 15 things at once and not have to make a to-do list. So it's a, it's, a, it's a change. We're not talking about the patient with dementia that needs help with their ADLs. We're talking about early stage or very mild uh, dementia or even just pre-dementia slash mild cognitive impairment, something like that. And But it's a change. So it's really important. Just to me, I find it freeing. I don't have to worry um, okay, you know, it's Friday morning. What do I need to do? I need, you know, and then, then, then you're kind of like juggling around in your brain, trying to figure out what's the most important. Whereas if I spend a few minutes this afternoon when we're done to project, okay, what do I need to do tomorrow? What do I need to do next week? When do I need to start looking at the, you know, the weather? Well, I've been looking at the weather in DC. It's pretty similar to California right now. <laughs> Not great. When do I need to start getting my stuff together in the suitcase and you know, just it, then nothing happens by surprise. I mean, surprises are nice. I don't mind surprises, but I don't, I don't like having to do things at the last minute. And I don't like to do things in a hurry because I always forget stuff. And that's annoying. Hate getting to the hotel and you've forgotten your nightshirt or your toothbrush or deodorant. <laughs> Those are the three things I always forget. So yeah. I, I need to make a packing list. I'm not good at packing lists. So that's, that's a, that's a plan because there's extra things I need to bring. But you mentioned people in the early stages, and that's the people that you're recruiting for this clinical trial for um, Agihelm, right? You called it the other word. Educatum. Ad yeah, that one. I can't pronounce that one. <laughs> so what goes into what, what kind of patient are you looking for just for general knowledge? I mean, obviously you said there was inclusion and exclusion factors what kind of factors are make a good clinical trial participant and what would exclude somebody obviously if they're in too late a stage that's a big exclusion 
Right. In general, we're looking for patients that are mild. We want patients with an MMSE, you know, in the mid 20s. We, we can go down to low 20s as well, but we want, you know, low 20s to 27 range. Um, out of 30, right? Out of 30, yep. Um, we want patients who, um, first of all, well, there has to be one of the main inclusion criteria is they have to have proven Alzheimer's disease, and that can be done by two ways. Number one, it can be done with doing a certain type of PET scan called an amyloid PET scan, which you'll probably see at your meeting coming up that it's we're getting closer at getting getting amyloid PET truly covered, uh, but we're not there yet. It's a very hard test to get covered by insurance, almost impossible right now, but hopefully we're getting closer to that. Uh, the other way we can do it is by doing what's called a spinal tap, and we actually take spinal fluid out of the lower back in the lumbar region, the lower back, and we look for a certain protein in there called amyloid, and amyloid is the pathologic protein that's part of Alzheimer's disease. So it's not seen in other neurodegenerative diseases. So if you can have what's called this biomarker, whether it be imaging biomarker or spinal fluid biomarker, then you can prove the diagnosis. Um, you, there's certain age criteria, but you know we want patients 60s and 70s in general. Um, and it's not very difficult to, in terms of the inclusion, exclusion. One of the big ones that we found that are excluding patients is because they need a certain type of MRI scan and the type of MRI scan looks for old brain hemorrhages and folks who have had previous brain hemorrhage, we cannot uh, include them in the trial. The reason why is because there is a condition called ARIA, which stands for amyloid related imaging abnormalities, A R I A. And there's two types of aria E, which is swelling, and H, which is hemorrhage. And in general, patients who have amyloid deposition in the brain, there is a phenomenon called amyloid angiopathy, which also affects the blood vessels. And these patients can be at a higher risk to have brain hemorrhage. So if they've already had any signs of brain bleeding, we will not include them in these trials because that we already know that they have an increased risk of bleeding. So we don't want any of those complications, uh, which is why early on and anyone who gets uh, uh, onboarded with these drugs, and we still have several patients on Adjuhelm from when it was paid for by CMS. Now they're on a drug program through the pharmaceutical company, uh, but we infuse them. Uh, you do... Uh, MRI scans of their brain with a certain protocol to look for this swelling and look for any areas of hemorrhage. So is the areas of hemorrhage, is that from maybe previous um, mini strokes, TIAs, or what causes that in general? Or is it a lot you know, of they, they can be from a lot of different things. A common thing would be chronic hypertension. Uh, but in general, we won't discriminate. The bottom line is if you've had a hemorrhage, you're done. You're, you, we, even if they have a good reason why, so to speak, they would be excluded. Now, if it's something else and we knew that there was a hemorrhage for a very specific reason, is that a reason now moving forward <clears throat> with a drug? If you're not in a clinical trial, I, I think we would we would consider infusing that patient, but in, in just a perfect situation, so to speak. So Algehelm has a risk factor of brain bleeds, essentially. Well, really any of the drugs do. It's 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 how the drug works. The drug works, well, all of the drugs that sequester amyloid, uh, think of amyloid as a very sticky protein. And as you're extruding or taking amyloid out of the central nervous system, the theory is that you are almost like ripping this off of tissue. And when you rip the protein out of tissue, it can cause swelling and bleeding. That makes sense. That's a really good good explainer. I wondered how it cleared, you know, cleared the amyloids from the brain. I mean, I find that very fascinating just because it's hard to, it's hard to visualize when, you know, cause I don't, I don't look at brains like you do. <laughs> I just talk yeah. about them. So one of the, one of the reasons that Medicare doesn't cover either Adjahelm or the new one, Lecanemab, also known yeah. as Lequimbi, is because it's very expensive, but there was some there were some disagreements with Adjahelm um, about its effectiveness, about the like the whole um, approval process had some controversy. Can you explain some of that and give us your opinion on whether it was warranted or just overblown? Or Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. 
I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about NeuroReserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I mean, I try not to get too far in the weeds in terms of everyone's opinions of why they dissected the trial. There were two trials. If we want to just break it down simply, there were two trials early on that led toward uh, Adjuhelm eventually getting um, eventually getting approved. And basically what it was, was the first one was marginal at best, that probably alone would not get it approved. And the second one was more robust. And it looked at higher dose and things like that of drug. And that ultimately led to its approval, despite the F there was an FDA advisory committee that went against it that said that there's not enough data, there are other factors, other proteins involved, there are so many other things. And I think the the folks at the front line um, we're probably excited to use the medication because at least it's something. I mean, our 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 tenant here at this institute was this is not perfect. Where we're at now is not is not where we're going to be one year, five year, or ten years from now for sure. But at least it's something that if we can buy the patient time to preserve or prevent neuronal loss for that period of time, then that's still that's still a good thing. So with mm-hmm. the right patient, with the right observation, again, the drug is not for everyone. So that's been our tenant, and we still stand by that. I agree with that. And what do you know about the new drug? Why is that one like a little bit more exciting? I mean, obviously, it's kind of like 2.0. Yeah. Uh, the data is better. Number one, the efficacy data uh, has edged out and beat um, aducanumab. Uh uh, that's number one. Number two, even more importantly, the safety data is better as well. So decreased number risk of um, ARIA-related brain abnormalities. That's important. Yeah. So don't need to cause any more problems. Right. And there's another one down the road, too, you know, in terms of denanumab and things like that. So. Well, I knew from, because I, on the legislative advocacy teams with the Alzheimer's Association, I knew and having talked to you previously, I knew what some of the challenges with um, aducanumab were. And so then they approved the canumab. But I also know that CMS, Medicare, um, is basically classified all those drugs as they're not going to cover them, which that class. seems really stupid. Yeah, that's really, I, I agree. I, I don't, I'm not going to use the word stupid, but. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> Yeah, go I mean, for it. it. I, it's basically, in my opinion, it's basically saying, well, this first one was, eh, it was okay. It maybe helped. Maybe it didn't. We're not so sure. Now we got this other one. It looks better, but we don't care. They don't seem to understand that they're not just going to keep developing drugs that are in the eh category. I mean, what would be the point? So that it's like we've learned from adju- ad- aducanumab. Now we've got lecanumab. And then you've just mentioned two others. And it's like, obviously, they're going to get better. So to just blanketly say, oh, well, no, we're not going to cover these. Again, like I said, I'll just use the word. It just seems stupid. It seems very short-sighted. Like, I'm assuming yeah. that... You know, it's funny. When, right. When it came out originally and, and CMS came down with um, any amyloid sequestering drug as a class, that that frustrated a lot of a lot of clinicians. Absolutely. Um and to make that statement without seeing what other drugs down the pipe 
we're maybe going to have a different trial design, going to have better results, going to have better safety data, what have you, it it um, probably a little short-sighted in terms of that. And now it's really hard, obviously, to reverse what was done already. I'm going to try. <laughs> that's That's my other job. Go to D.C. and harass them, mm-hmm. make them understand. I don't know how much good it'll do, but can't uh it won't change if we don't try so i think right. what the alzheimer's association's got planned sounds very exciting there's going to be a rally in lafayette square across from the white house so i've never been to either one of those places so that'll be cool That's great. um you, you know it's it's i'm using my file my frequent flyer miles not my you know my credit card miles and doing what I can because it's important. I mean, my mom's gone, but it's still important for future generations, future caregivers, future families. So what else can you tell us about, like, what are you looking for in, or how long is the, the trial that you guys are ramping up going to take? Like, yeah, how, I what's the, the, yeah, I don't know the end date at this point. Um, obviously the first thing is just onboarding patients and getting them randomized. So, uh, other sites have certainly done that. I, I'd have to look up that answer as to when the end date is. I'm assuming it's a little bit long term, like maybe a year. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's well over a year. There's no okay. question about that. Yeah, this is long term. Okay. That's kind of what I assumed, but, you know, assuming is never safe. And they've done they've done clinical trials with Aduhelm, Aducanumab. What is, are you looking for specific things? What is the end result of the trial? What do you, what's the goal? Yeah, the goal is similar to what the original trial was looking for. I mean, in a nutshell, it's basically to see with different um, cognitive assessments, the percent of decline over a period of time. And depending on, again, taking into other accounts, because they really want to, <clears throat> they really want to get forth um better diverse, a more diverse patient population in this next subset of patients. Which is important. We said that earlier. And that was, I had a question in my head and it just disappeared. This is what happens when you have a cold. Um, oh, the cognitive decline. That's got to be pretty hard to measure um, evenly, or that's maybe not the right word, but well, there's I'm caregiver, assuming- there's direct patient assessments and there's caregiver assessments. So there's a battery of tests that are done you know, over over time that are repeatedly done. Again, you know, when we're talking about day-to-day management of patients, we don't do those. We'll do mini mental states, like we said, or what are called MOCA, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tests. Those are easy to do at the bedside that just take a few minutes, you know, as opposed to ADAS COG or more, more in-depth uh, neurocognitive assessments or even formal neuropsychometric testing. So all these things take, you know, a lot more time, not just minutes, but hours in terms of getting them done. So when you're doing a clinical trial, then you're doing a much deeper dive in terms of their cognitive assessments and you're giving you're getting caregiver reports as well. So that brings up another good point as well in terms of inclusion criteria. You need a patient who has good family support to be able to um, do their assessment as well. That makes sense. I, most people that have this disease need su- su- significant support. But oh, that's hard to say. Um, but do you run across many patients that don't? Um, in general, no, not in our patient population in the suburban. That makes sense. Um, what was I going to ask? There was another question. Oh, <laughs> oh you are um, you are infusing your own patients, your own clinical patients, some of them with Agihelp, how is that going with them? What are Uh, your findings? I mean, some patients are on a few months, some are on a little over a year in terms of infusion. I think our longest patient is maybe 14 or 15 infusions in total. Um, I would say they're stable. I mean, we had we throughout our cohort of patients, throughout our doctors, we had two cases of aria, one that we stopped the drug temporarily and resumed, and one that we had to stop completely. And the others, we've had a couple patients that were on the drug that dropped off for other reasons, but not complications from the drug. Uh, and then the others are continuing to get monthly infusions. Now, my mom had Alzheimer's for twenty years, and so she was 
stable for a long period of time. And then she'd have like a little dip. It was like really long steps. I mean, it would be in the earlier stages, it was probably years. And then all of a sudden she'd dip and then we'd have a new normal. Is that hard to assess when you've got somebody on this drug? I mean, well, I, my, my thought is it's like, I'm not sure you would know if my mom had stabilized because of the drug or that's just because that's what her pathology of the disease looked like. Yeah. Or is that even normal? I mean, some of it is, again, just your general rapport with the patient and what you what you glean from examining them and what you get from caregivers, spouses, children, and things like that. And then there's also more objective things, whether you do MOCAs or MMSEs for follow-up. Now, that's just in clinical practice. Like I said, you're able to get greater detail in the studies that are done in clinical trials from your raters that are also involved in the trials. Um, like I'm not a rater per se, but I would be the treating physician. So in that instance, then you will get more concrete data. So otherwise it's, it's tougher to do over short periods of time, over long periods of time, obviously you will be able to see declines, but over even just a 12 month time frame, I think it's really tough to make that decision unless someone's really going downhill fast. At which point they wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for these drugs. Well, then you st if you're if they're really rapidly progressive, you have to start looking for other causes. That's for sure, but it still could be a rapidly progressive Alzheimer's disease. That's true. I don't think I've known too many people. Most people around a decade, not too many people get to twenty years like we did, which is good and bad. <laughs> but it's what what's the average uh, length of time most people like in your practice that they they live with this disease. Yeah, I think you nailed it around seven to 10 years. Okay. I knew 20 was a long time. And it's actually longer when you look back with 2020 vision and go, oh, yeah, that was probably a sign, which, you know, you right. don't, it's easy to, like I've discussed, my mom would take orders from clients and not write down due dates or directions or anything useful. And it was very easy to dismiss when she was 53. And, you know, you've got a busy business, things disrupt what you were doing and you, forget and somebody else puts the order in the, you know, the order slots and off you go. And the next thing you know, somebody's like, Oh, what the heck do I do? And then when it started happening more frequently and it happened on the day before her day off very frequently, then it was like, okay, wait a minute, something's going on. And my grandmother also had vascular dementia. So it was kind of like, Oh, you're starting to resemble your mother. This is not a good sign, which she didn't like to hear, but when you look back, you can be like, okay, I think it was actually even longer than 20 years, but for sure 20. Yeah. And I think I've known one person that was like 30, but that was also probably looking back going, oh yeah, they probably had it back then when these things started happening that we easily dismissed. <clears throat> How do people get in clinical trials? That's probably a very good question. I know because I'm signed up with trial match. I just don't have any qualifying factors yet thank god <laughs> right some people can do that there's a uh, there's definitely online resources some people hear about them through advertisements of of companies that are actively trying to recruit patients there's businesses out there that do that um for us it's really it's quite simple i mean we we advertise amongst our partners whether it be a migraine an ms or a dementia clinical trial and we sort of just put out some bullet points of inclusion or exclusion criteria and then we would forward that medical well we would first have a discussion with the patient say do you have your do we have your permission to you know give your information to they're employed by us you know to have your chart reviewed by one of our screeners and then they would review the chart and then give them a call, ask them some additional follow-up questions and describe the clinical trial, whatever it may be, whatever disease state. And then that's how we can try to onboard a patient. That's really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen any. Well, I guess I've seen that. No, those are lawyers. But we have I've a database of, you know, tens of thousands of patients that we treat. So, you know, at us with, you know, close to 30 providers, we're able to amass a great number of patients with neurological diseases. So that's how we're able to do it. That's amazing. I think that's very fascinating. Is there anything else you would like to tell the audience about the Michigan Institute of Neurological Disorders? I think I got that right again. Um, like I said, I mean, our main focus right now where we're trying to, where we're really trying to do a better job because <laughs> these diseases are so complex. 
sort of our evolution of what we want to do is we really want to have like centers of excellence in all these different disease states. And like, you know, our MS center is, is top notch. We have a wonderful infusion center. Our Parkinson's center is top notch. You know, our migraine and headache Institute, we're building the dementia and memory care center. So all of these different things, you know, we'd like to have a neuromuscular center, for example. So all of these different fields of neurology, neurology is so broad and difficult by itself. And in the old days, there weren't as many therapeutics. And now there are therapeutics and these therapeutics are complex depending on the disease state. So we want, we want to have subspecialty experts in each field that could sort of lead those, lead those departments, even though we have a dozen plus general neurologists that can see all of those conditions with expertise. That makes sense. So I'm going to ask you one last tough question. I know my maternal great grandmother had what they called senile dementia. She died before I was born. I was born in late 66. Do you feel like in general, we are more aware of these diseases that have, that are happening or is things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other diseases, are they, are they happening more or are we just aware of them more than maybe 75, 80 years ago? Well, I think it's the latter and we have therapeutics to address them and we have greater expertise in clinical, you know, in clinicians in terms of diagnosing them. I don't know that anything is like on an epidemic rise in terms of these neurodegenerative diseases, in terms of trajectory going up of incidence and or prevalence, uh, but we are doing a much better job and really, I mean, this is not unique to neurology in, in, in all disease states of diagnosing problems. And I think the other thing is patients care, you know, people care for themselves in a different way than they did, you know, 50 years ago. And you died young from other things 50 years ago that you don't anymore. We have, we can control hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, cancer in much better ways than we did before. Patient that maybe died in their 50s and 60s that would have never developed Alzheimer disease is now developing in their 70s and 80s because we fixed their heart or cured their breast cancer. <laughs> that makes sense. I guess I always wonder... Um, so my paternal great grandmother was the oldest of 14. She traveled across the country in a covered wagon and did live in a dugout. This was, she told me these stories at the height of the little house on the prairie series yeah. on TV popularity. Yeah. You probably remember those. Um, and as a nine-year-old child, little house on the prairie was more interesting than her stories, unfortunately for me. And I kind of sometimes wonder, like, she literally, at 78, they put a pacemaker in for an irregular heartbeat. And because she could feel it, it just freaked her out. And she just said, that's it. And she gave up and she died. I mean, the, there wasn't really uh, an underlying reason. It just, she literally just couldn't live with this pacemaker thing, which I find fascinating. But I always wonder, like, back in the early 1900s, somebody like my mom, they probably thought she was like a crazy witch, and I kind of, I don't know, I get weird, <laughs> think about weird things. And I just wonder how the, how, you know, how often the, you know, families dealt with it, you know, a hundred years ago. I don't know why I think like that. It's just my curious brain. So is there anything, any tidbit you want to leave the audience with before I let you go save the rest of the world? Yeah. No, I like what we talked about in the beginning. I like the idea of the organization, the to-do list, the calendar, and making yourself accountable, crossing things off when you complete the task. I think those are important things that, unfortunately, we're all doing in our 50s that maybe we, because our lives are so chaotic that we we have to do that. But <clears throat> I love expressing those tips to my patient and my patients, and I think they benefit from that. So I like that the best of what we what we talked about early on in the in our meeting. And not multitasking is actually better, correct? Well, multitasking is okay, but if you're multitasking to a point that you're unable to finish a task or finish or making mistakes along the way, then then we're doing too much. So, because I know Maria Shriver's um, the Women's Alzheimer's Movement, they they recommend not multitasking, especially on complex tasks. So yeah, I try well, to stick those, to one thing yeah, at a time. There you go. Yeah, that way I get them done. Like you said, you get them done, you scratch them off, you move on to the next thing, you, know, yeah, you keep scratching those off. Yeah. I love it. Well, I appreciate this. Um well, I'm, better. Oh, I will. It's just I got to get the crud going out. And it'll it'll, you know, just takes time and mother nature's got to stop messing with the weather. And I might have to move the peloton in the house in the winter. 
Okay. Because that's, it's generally 47 degrees in the garage when I go out there and do my workout. I do have a space heater and I find it very fascinating that the garage is cold and you're still sweating. Um, but I've had instances where I've come in the house and I've been wheezing. So it is definitely cold weather and exercise induced, I guess, asthma. I don't have asthma, but right now I have lungs that aren't happy with me. So, you know, it's like what we were talking about earlier. Sometimes you got to make lifestyle changes. And if I have to move the Peloton in the house for the winter, well, I've already scoped some of those spots out. So (laughs) it wasn't in the house last winter because we had really old crappy garage doors and the garage was literally about 20 degrees colder than outside. I didn't even go in the garage. It's like, nope, too cold. Which, you know, for me, it was like, well, we've had days that are high of 35, so that's way too cold for me. <laughs> I'm a solar-charged person. I like the sun, which is not out right now, even though it's still daytime for us. So, you know, lifestyle choices are important, and that's, if I have to make a change for that, then I will. Okay. Well, I appreciate this, and maybe we can talk again when the trial is closer to being done. Sounds good. I'll talk to you soon. All righty. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.